So okay, what's going to happen is, so there's there's our moderator right there, David, okay, and our speaker is in the, in the purple. You can put lapel mics on both of them for now, okay. and have them both muted yes. for now. So Michael is leaving his bag there. All right, I'll come back for you. And then the, just those chairs. Yeah. As soon as she's done presenting, just bring the chairs. But yeah, just hang. I would take that front seat right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I should go and. I just want to make sure that I don't know if I told you. That he's going to be what casting. I think we should have just a little bit of this. Okay, great. Oh, one more thing. Is this slide okay? I mean, the slides are right there. Otherwise, I can show you something else.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ed Wasserman. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism here. And you're, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Uh, sorry about the chill. We are just sort of, however, reflecting where our, uh, our honored guest tonight, our speaker tonight, uh, normally resides. They've had seven O inches of snow over the past few weeks. So we, we do need to give thanks. Um, this is the inaugural event of a spring term series featuring outstanding experts in food politics, healthcare, and healthcare policy. Uh, the series is a collaboration between the School of Journalism and the School of Public Health and is made possible by generous support of the Kaiser Permanente Institute for Health Policy, represented here tonight by the man who helped bring this together, Brian Raymond. Please wave. Now, the series will continue in March with a panel on the cost of the new medication for hepatitis C. Um, in April, there will be a panel on the health care and societal costs of the antibiotics crisis, which will include our, our own uh, J-School professor and best-selling author, Michael Pollan, who I think is here tonight. Michael? And the final event will be in May. There will be a conversation with author, cardiologist, and New York Times columnist Sandeep Johar. Now, this collaboration between the schools of public health and the school of journalism uh, has deepened over the past several years with the help of outside supporters. Among them, and represented here tonight, the California Endowment, the California Wellness Foundation, and Berkeley Wellness. Thanks to all of you. Now, this series is being live, live streamed. It grew out of a program funded by Kaiser and the Institute for Health Policy, which have been generous in creating fellowships for second year students pursuing health care health policy master's projects. Now, their support has helped sustain this cross-campus collaboration and commitment to our unique joint degree program that enables students to pursue master's degrees in journalism and public health simultaneously, giving them an exceptional capacity, we believe, to understand and explain and probe some of the most nettlesome matters of public policy and public purpose that are before the society. So thanks to all of our supporters here tonight, and thanks to you for joining us here as well. And now it's my pleasure. Uh, the, the, the conversation will happen tonight between our guests of honor, who our person I'm about to introduce will introduce, uh, and Dave Tuller, a lecturer, has a joint uh, appointment in both the uh, Journalism School and School of Public Policy. And now it's my pleasure to present uh, Dr. Stefano Bartozzi, Dean of the School of Public Health. Thanks, Ed. Um, Thank you all for coming, and I just want to reiterate my appreciation to Brian and Kaiser for helping to make all of this possible. Um, these, are, these are a terrific series of talks, and we're very privileged tonight to have a woman who, well, when I was going to meet her last week, last year for the first time, I was so excited because this is a woman who is so famous in nutrition, they named one of the world's largest companies after her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the um, the... Her background is actually, I, I knew that she was, before I met her, I knew that she was a graduate of the School of Public Health. She has her MPH from Berkeley. What I didn't know until today was that she also has a PhD in molecular biology from Berkeley. 
I don't even know where you went undergrad. And probably it's better not to know. Berkeley. Oh, Berkeley, even you're a bear all the way through. <laughs> so um, it's great to have her here. It's not her first time here, but it's great to have her back. And the, um, the thing that I found remarkable when I learned a little bit more about her background is that with her undergraduate degree here and her PhD in molecular biology and her MPH in nutrition, she's a natural to be a professor of sociology at NYU. So this just shows you the extraordinary adaptability that Berkeley graduates have. She's also the Paulette Goddard Professor of the Department of Nutrition, Food Sciences, and Public Health at NYU, which she chaired for many years from 88 to 2003, I think. Now, in addition to all of that, she's done remarkable work with the US government. She's been responsible for major reports. And as you can see here in front of you, has written a large number of very popular, very important, very influential books. Um, that probably the one that's been the most cited is What to Eat. Is that fair? Food politics, Food politics yeah? OK, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really my great pleasure to welcome Marion Nessel um, here back to Berkeley, and um, to thank her also for the teaching that she's doing while she's here, for what she's done in the past, for mentoring our students, and for supporting our university and our school. So Marion, thank you so much. Am I on? No. Yes. Thanks, Steph, that, for the nice introduction. And thanks to the Kaiser people. When I lived in California, I was a Kaiser patient. And I wish you were on the East Coast. Um, and it's really nice to be here. And I thank you all for coming on this, what in California uh, passes for cold. <laughs> you say. Um, I thought what I would do tonight, because this is a series on healthcare, would be to try to relate the work that I do to healthcare in some way. And it's pretty easy to do that because I think of myself as a food systems person, and my translation of what food systems are is everything from food production to consumption, from agriculture to food to nutrition to public health. Um, and I have to say that uh, when I was studying nutrition and was uh, trying to understand all of that, I really didn't understand what agriculture had to do uh, with the way people eat. And it took me a long time to catch up. But I now think that you can't understand anything about the way people eat in America or anywhere else, for that matter, unless you understand how our agricultural production system works, and I will try to explain some of that as I go along. Um, what all this has to do with public health is pretty obvious, um, but all you have to do is go on the internet, and this particular aphorism is absolutely everywhere. True healthcare reform starts in your kitchen, not in Washington. I wish I'd said that. Um, but it seems like a really good idea, and. Uh, anyone who reads this is going to have, you're all going to have your own interpretation of what it means, and I'm going to give you mine. Uh, and mine starts uh, in the usual public health terms, which is to try to identify what the biggest public health problems are. And it seems to me that the largest public health problems uh, in 2015, from agriculture to public health, have to do with, uh, if you count by numbers, food insecurity. Roughly a billion people in the world are considered food insecure. They don't have enough food to eat. Another billion uh, suffer from obesity and its health consequences. And then the environmental damage that is occurring, uh, climate change, these kinds of things in our society, all of them have as a common cause dysfunctional food systems. That's not the complete cause, but it's certainly a partial cause of all of that. Let me just say a few things about food insecurity. Every year, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations comes out with a report and counts the number of people who, by its definition, are hungry and don't have enough food to eat on a daily basis. And the good news last year was that only 842 million people suffer from chronic hunger, a decrease of 26 million since 2012. This report has been criticized very heavily by people who pay close attention to methodology. 
and they claim that the reason those numbers went down was because the methods changed. Um, but whatever the actual number is, it's very, very large and something that everybody should be worried about. And it's not just an international problem. It's also a problem in the United States. The Department of Agriculture also counts uh, the number of people who are considered food insecure in the United States. And the last report said that 14% of the population uh, was defined by their definition uh, is food insecurity, they're food insecure, which means they don't have enough food on a daily basis. They can't count on having enough food on a daily basis to meet their needs um, by legal means. Um, and 10% of children are said to be food insecure. And people who are food insecure in the United States are more likely to have a low income. That seems pretty straightforward. They're also more likely to be uh, members of racial and ethnic minorities, and they are paradoxically more likely to be overweight or obese. Now, the cost of food insecurity in this country is staggering. Um, these are figures from food stamps, this is what used to be called the food stamp program and is now called SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition As Assistance Program. And in 2014, uh, it cost the American taxpayer $70 billion in direct benefits to food stamp recipients and another $4 billion in administrative costs. And you can see that since the late 60s until 2014, these numbers have just gone up and up and up and up. So there are huge costs associated with food insecurity in the United States. And this connects to the healthcare system in um, pretty straightforward ways. This paper is called Treat or Eat, Food Insecurity. Um, and its conclusion is that about one in every three chronically ill participants in food stamp programs is, uh, or or people who are chronically ill are unable to afford food, medications, or both. So if you're poor in this country, you're not only going to be able not to be able to afford food, but you're also not going to be able to afford whatever medications you need, and that's going to make your illness even worse. Um, so let's move on from food insecurity to the next problem, which is obesity. And I'm just going to talk about obesity in the United States, although it's a worldwide problem. And the, uh, if you look at the rise in the prevalence of obesity from 1980 to the present, it's gone up steadily since that time. And obesity carries with it. It's not just a cosmetic problem. If it were, I wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, but it carries with it a large number of risks. Obesity obviously raises health risks, and that's shown here. Heart disease, cancer, um, stroke, sleep apnea, and a whole bunch of other problems. But it also increases the risks that go along with treatment and the costs um, of, of treatment and personal and medical costs. And these are simply staggering. First of all, health costs, the most important uh, health implication of obesity is type 2 diabetes. It's not that everyone who is overweight gets type 2 diabetes, but if you do have type 2 diabetes, the chances are very high that you are overweight. And this is a worldwide problem. If you look at the rise in prevalence of type 2 diabetes from the early 1980s until the present, it's just gone from 30 million people in the world to more than 200. And the estimates are that by 2030, there will be 400 million people in the world with type 2 diabetes, which is a condition that requires lifetime treatment um, if you don't lose weight. So that's um, of really major concern. But there are other costs as well. One is that the use of um, obesity drugs and devices has gone up. Drugs are shown in red in the figure on the upper left and devices in blue. Somebody's got to pay for them and the costs have gone from roughly uh, a very small number of billion dollars to 
seven billion dollars in uh, or more in oh no that's seven you know seven billion dollars in 20 the estimate is by 2015 and the number of surgeries has increased these are bariatric surgeries and I think these figures are these graphs are absolutely shocking um, that there is so much of this expensive intervention and it's not uh, surprising that the expense is very high. The medical costs of treating obesity uh, are staggering and they involve not only health care but also the drugs and surgery that you just saw the graphs for. And I, I, I don't know what the actual figure is. I've seen estimates of the, co of the annual cost of obesity that range from 150 billion to 450 billion a year. It depends on whose estimate you look at and how these figures are done. I don't know what the correct figure is, but it's extremely high. And there's one estimate that the annual cost of being overweight is nearly $20 a pound of, of extra weight. Whatever it is, it's staggering costs to individuals and to society. And what's really sad about it is that much of it can be prevented. And it can be prevented very simply by eating less, eating better, and moving more. And please don't eat my book. Um, and if it seems more complicated than that, it's because of the consequences of eating better. Eating better means eating more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, all those healthy things you hear about all the time, and less of the junk foods, um, and high calorie sodas and junk foods and other kinds of uh, thing, processed foods. But the problem is that the junk foods are much more profitable to the companies that make them than are the fruits and vegetables that everyone is hoping that people will actually eat. And so the real difficulty here is that eating less and eating better are very, very bad for business. And this was discussed eloquently in 2007 by an executive of Coca-Cola who gave an interview to Advertising Age in which he said that obesity had become the Achilles heel of her company. It used to be that Coca-Cola didn't have to worry about obesity at all, uh, and now it's something the company has to worry about every single day of its working life. As she put it, it's a huge, huge issue. And if you need more evidence for that, Coca-Cola every year, as all publicly traded companies do, must report to the Security and Exchange Commission uh, what the risks are to the company's business. And at the end of 2013, the 2014 one isn't out yet, but I bet it says exactly the same thing. Uh, the number one risk to Coca-Cola's profitability is obesity and its consequences because of the enormous pressure from health advocates to get people to stop drinking sodas. Obesity may reduce demand. Everybody is talking about how people would be healthier uh, if people didn't drink sodas, and Berkeley passed a soda tax. There you go. So you're right at the cutting edge of all of the problems that these industries have. So I've said that the prevalence of obesity started to rise beginning in the early 1980s, and here's another example of that. The arrow points to 1980, and you can see that the prevalence of obesity in adults has gone up consistently since then. The sharp rise on the right is projected to 2030. Now, what this must mean is that people are either eating more or moving less, uh, or eating worse. So let me say something about the physical activity part of this first, because I'm not going to say very much about it. Um, Counterintuitive as it may be, uh, it does not seem as if people are less physically active now than they were in the early 1980s. I don't want to push this too hard, because the data on physical activity are even worse than the data on dietary intake, but they do not show much change in physical activity since 1980. On the other hand, there is a very large body of evidence from two or three lines of research that people are eating more. 
Um, the first and the most graphic is calories in the food supply have gone up since 1980. Up until about 1980, the average number of per capita calories in the food supply was about 3,200 uh, calories per day per person. And starting in 1980, where the arrow points, uh, the number of calories in the food supply started going up quite dramatically. And it's now around 4,000 calories a day. Uh, that rise in the number of calories parallels the rise in obesity in the United States. So we have, and even if a lot of those calories are wasted, it's still more than most people need. And 4,000 is about twice as much as most people need. So we have to ask the question, what happened in 1980? What changed since 1980? And most people who have looked at this say that there are major societal forces uh, that changed at about that time. We got more globalization, more technology, um, and the ones that I'm interested in are policies that favored big business, and these included tax policies, anti-union policies, and deregulation. And I want to say something about deregulation in particular, but to point out that all of these are food system issues, and that uh, the food system bears on some of this and each of these, and in each of these changes. So let me say something about deregulation. The first kind of deregulation was of agriculture. And that happened in the 1970s when instead of paying agribusiness and farmers to not grow food um, and to let their land go fallow and to conserve it, uh, the government began paying farmers to grow as much food as they possibly could. The famous hedgerow to hedgerow um, that Earl Butts was reputed to have said, although I can't find a quote for that. Uh, and the result of the deregulation of agriculture and the introduction of a system that paid farmers to grow as much food as they possibly could was mountains of corn in a sea of, foods, of farm subsidies um, and a very cheap food supply in which there was a lot of food available. The second kind of deregulation made that even worse, and that was a form of deregulation of Wall Street. Prior to the early 1980s, the Wall Street really valued blue chip stocks. You don't even hear about blue chip stocks anymore. These were stocks that gave long, slow return on investment. Beginning in the early 1980s, uh, what got started was something called the shareholder value movement, which was a movement um, that placed pressures on publicly traded corporations to produce higher immediate returns on investment. We want more money and we want it right now. And of course what that did was to put pressure on all kinds of corporations and you see the result of that on Wall Street now. But for food corporations it was especially difficult because remember they were trying to sell food products in an environment in which 4,000 calories are available for every man, woman, and little tiny baby in the country. And that's really competitive to sell food under those circumstances. Um, but now it was even worse because in addition to having to make a profit, they had to grow their profits every 90 days and report growth to <coughs> Wall Street. Um, they did get one break, however, and that was that when President Reagan came in in 1980 on a deregulatory agenda, one of the things that got deregulated was food marketing to children. And so companies were able to invest large amounts of money, much more than they ever had before, um, in marketing to children. And we see the results of that in the marketplace. Now, it's very, very difficult to get hard numbers on the amount of money that food companies spent, uh, spend on marketing specific products, but every now and then Advertising Age publishes a few of them, usually in their edition at the end of June every year. And so what you see on this slide is a summary of the $17 billion that the food industry spends on advertising every year, but only advertising that goes through advertising agencies so it's countable. Um, they also advertise foods in other ways that's not countable, so it's going to be north of that figure. 
But the 202 under Coca-Cola is $202 million spent on advertising in 2013 just for Coca-Cola Classic. The 32 million for Pop-Tarts is just for Pop-Tarts. And the 158 million for M&Ms is, uh, is just for M&Ms. So any nationally advertised product is going to have a fortune spent on marketing it, a fortune that so much exceeds the government's ability to advertise or to market healthier foods or to do anything else. Uh, about nutrition education, that they're not even in the same stratosphere. And you see the results of marketing um, on food product labels. These are two of my favorite. Um, I just really like these. Um, so I love the chocolate Teddy Grahams, which because they have calcium, iron, and zinc are now health foods. Companies are allowed to put vitamins into cookies and market them as health foods. And um, I love it that Kellogg's Fruit Loops with marshmallows yet is a good source of vitamin D. <laughs> you live in Berkeley, just go outside. Get all the vitamin D you need. Uh, so food companies had to change society in order to sell more of their products. Um, and they had, because food was so cheap, it was easier for people to eat outside the home. And if you look, most of the food outside the home that grew was in fast food. And if you look more closely at fast food, what we're really talking about is pizza. And notice that that curve goes up. The arrow points to 1980. It goes up in parallel with obesity. If you're a bad epi epidemiologist, you're going to say pizza causes obesity. You know, it just might. But it could also be sodas which in 1980 also increased greatly in the food supply in the United States and Canada. And note that um, starting in about 1998, uh, the, the consumption of soda started to decline in the United States. And it looks like the leveling off of obesity uh, may have occurred in part because of that. And then the one other th really big change that came about was that the number of large portions in the food supply increased, again, in parallel with the percent of overweight in the population and with the rise in the number of calories per person per day. Um, and I think that large portions are a sufficient explanation for obesity. Uh, if I had one thing that I could teach the American public, it would be that larger portions have more calories. <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face, but you'll have to trust me on this one. It's not intuitively obvious. <laughs> or at least people don't act as if it is. And then the other thing that food companies did was to just put food everywhere, absolutely everywhere. I was in San Francisco last week, and at the Walgreens on Powell Street, I couldn't believe it. The entire first floor, it's the most enormous store, and the entire first floor is now a grocery store with takeout food and a, a frozen yogurt bar and the most amazing things in it. Um, if you go to a bath shop, and this one is in, um, is in Manhattan, it looks like a food store, and Staples has an office snacks section. Um, the more food that's available, the more it's in front of you, the more you'll buy. Um, so if we want to do something about obesity, we have to do something about the environment. And this cartoon sort of says it all. You've got to eat out of a different parking lot. Um, the one other factor that is important to understand in this is the whole price factor. And I love using this example. If you go to McDonald's uh, with $5, you can buy five hamburgers or you can buy one salad, and that salad will cost you more than $5 these days. And you have to ask what that's about. Um, how is it that one salad could cost less, uh, could cost the same as five hamburgers? And that has to do with federal policies that make the cost of some foods cheaper than the cost of other foods. And if you doubt, that the, these costs are different, then you need to look at these data from the Department of Commerce, um, which look at the change in indexed prices of various kinds of foods over time, always starting in 1980, which is our baseline for all of this. And since 1980, the indexed uh, change in monthly food prices 
has gone up by 40% for fresh fruits and vegetables and gone down by 15 to 30% for beer, butter, and sodas. So our federal policies are deeply involved in that, and that is why I think we have a government which is in, in coordination with the food industry, has created an environment that encourages people to eat more, um, and we're all very amenable to eating more and love doing it, and so there you are. And so in this kind of environment, eating less and eating better is really, really difficult to do. It's not something that individuals can do on their own. It's something that really, I think, requires policy changes. And so that gets us into the sticky business of regulation. And we live in a co country that doesn't like regulation very much. But this article from the American Heart Asso Association Journal summarizes all of the different regulatory approaches that have had some success in either pilot studies or small studies or um, in some cases national trends. And they involve education, bans, restrictions, taxes, and subsidies. Um, and the, you can read the list, it's a great big long list. Um, but all of them have been shown to be efficacious in at least some kind of, some research basis for them. And so there's a big push among health advocates and among food advocates to try to figure out ways in which regulations could um, be used and could be used more effectively. And of course, the whole push for soda taxes was an example of that. And because of the success of some of these regulatory strategies, food companies have fought back, and they fought back hard. Um, and here's my list um, of the way in which food companies deal with uh, food advocacy and health advocacy. Uh, and the ways are very, very similar to the ways that cigarette companies dealt with exactly the same problem. They blame personal responsibility, try to do everything they can to undermine the science, promote education of individuals and physical activity. They get very, very involved in co-opting community groups, professional organizations. Um, when things get tough, they attack critics, including me, and they do a great deal of lobbying, and when nothing else works, they do lawsuits. And we saw this in New York City, where I usually live, uh, during Mayor Bloomberg's ill-fated idea about capping the size of sodas at 16 ounces, um, the soda rule, in which <coughs> the the soda industry pulled out all stops. And this is a quick summary of the kinds of things that they did, and those of you who are involved in the Berkeley Tax Initiative will recognize it because it's exactly the same kinds of things went on here. Uh, they developed their own um, grassroots advocacy groups, AstroTurf is what they're referred to as. Uh, you know, they paid people to do canvassing, they did advertising, lots and lots of TV ads, and um, I got a home mailing on the Berkeley soda cap, and then the soda company trucks were covered with signs saying, don't let bureaucrats tell you what size beverage to buy. These are your personal rights that are being trampled on. And those of you who are here in Berkeley during the Measure D election last fall saw exactly the same kind of thing taking place in Berkeley. In fact, one of the things that I think was involved in, um, in getting the soda tax to win was the widespread recognition of what the soda industry was doing there. So all of this and these kinds of things made David Ludwig and I, David is a pediatrician in Boston, and a couple of years ago, we wrote an article for the Journal of the American Medical Association called Can the Food Industry Play a Constructive Role in the Obesity Epidemic? We were dubious. Um, we thought that the goals of industry, which are very simple, sell more food, uh, were not necessarily the goals of public health, and even though there's no intrinsic reason why the goals have to be incompatible, in practice, they generally are. Uh, so what to do about all this? Well, I would be depressed about what the food industry is doing and the way in which it operates, 
um, if I didn't think we were in the middle of a food movement that I think is not doing too badly. Um, and the food movement is interesting for um, my practicing sociology without a license. Um, I occasionally teach courses on, food mo on the food movement. And it's really interesting because it's different from the environmental movement, the women's movement, and the civil rights movement, in that it's much more diffuse and has lots and lots of different organizations, slow food, locavore, animal rights, organic, even the edible movement. I love the edibles. Um, but these are all couched in movement terms, but they're diffuse. The goals are very, very diffuse. There isn't a single goal that unites everybody except to have a food system that's healthier for people and the planet. Um, and we see aspects, I mean, you're so lucky to be in Berkeley where you've got so many pieces of the food movement in action uh, on the campus and off the campus. The, uh, you know, you've got food move, the food month and edible education and the extraordinary victory, uh, the tax victory, which I think is really, was very, very important and meaningful well beyond the idea that, well, it's Berkeley. Uh, I don't think it can be dismissed out of hand. The food movement is uh, not only on the ground here, but it's been very interesting to me to see that the First Lady of the United States uh, is interested in exactly the same kind of issues that I am. And has, she's been making a series of speeches, particularly lately, t pushing much, much harder on the agenda that the White House has had. Uh, and you know, whether you think what goes on in the White House is good, bad, or indifferent, and whether it's been useful or not, for me it's been absolutely thrilling to find somebody at that level of government who is interested in the same kinds of issues that I am. Now, I'm also, because we're in the Bay Area and because the, uh, the critical thinkers about nutrition are uh, in this area, I want to say something about the critique of the food movement. Um, and that critique, uh, if I can summarize it fairly, says that the movement really doesn't have any power. It's about consumption and pleasure, not changing the system. Uh, it gets people distracted from real civic participation, competes for resources, perpetuates race and class inequities, and produces no lasting change. Um, well, that I think is a glass half empty view. And I turn out to be a glass half full kind of person. And so I want to say some things about where I think the food movement is really succeeding. Um, for one thing, people are drinking less soda. The soda industry thinks this is because of health advocacy, and I'm not going to argue with them. Uh, I think so too. I look at it as an advocacy success. Here are other examples of quantifiable advocacy successes. The numbers of farmers markets in the United States, up and up and up from the early 70s until the present. The, uh, the, the rise in uh, expenditure on organic foods from 2004, when the rules went in until 2013, uh, the yellow bars are sales, and the blue is growth, so growth is down, but sales are up. And even such matters as uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, having this wonderful carrot in the medical symbol there, I think is absolutely wonderful in the farmer's market, which I think I'm supposed to go visit on Friday. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. And then, um, for those of you who were fortunate enough to hear Eric Schlosser and his colleagues um, last night, the whole movement towards trying to get low-wage low wage workers to have a living wage. Uh, and this is not just the restaurant workers who get 213 an hour, but it's also all of the different work groups who are working on farm worker justice. Um, all of these have a great deal to do with our health system and a great deal to do with both personal and public health. So what I'm urging everybody to do is to advocate. I want to turn, I teach because I want all of my students to turn into public health advocates of one kind or another, either through the food movement or any other way they want to do it. 
Um, and I think we advocate personal responsibility. You have an opportunity to vote with your fork and make your own personal choices about food. This will have a big effect on the marketplace. Um, and I advise food, not product. Smaller portions, that would be a good way to do it. Um, and I'm greatly in favor of local sustainable food, growing food, growing your own food. I grow food on my terrace in Manhattan, not this month. Uh, and cooking at home and teaching kids to cook, which is the most radical thing you can do. But at the same time, I think it's really important to advocate social responsibility and policy changes. And the list of policy changes that are needed and that are worth working on goes all the way from agriculture to public health. And this is my great big long list here. Um, and I think the, you know, I, on the agriculture side, we should all be um, advocating for sustainable, organic, local uh, agriculture, for food safety, for the farm bill, for a better farm bill, and for farm, and for uh, much better conditions for farm workers. And at the same time, we can advocate for a public health environment that makes it easier for people to make healthier food choices and therefore to be healthier in general. And these range from what I think are some of the easier ones, which is fixing food in schools, uh, to some of the more difficult ones, which is changing campaign funding laws. Everybody should be working to overturn Citizens United. And then I wonder if we could change Wall Street so they could back off somehow on these 90-day growth things that they require, and then ways in which to hold corporations accountable for the way they behave. Um, and these are the kinds of things I discuss in my book, Eat, Drink, Vote, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. See what the microphones do. Is he on? <laughs> He's on. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. I really appreciate your, your coming out here. Um, I, I guess I'm not Stephen Brill. Yes, well, you're not, I'm, I'm so glad you're not Stephen Brill. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, what would, if, if there was one one policy change that you could make, just one? impact this? What, would, what do you think it would be? Oh, you can't just do one. Um, I mean, one for what? Well, okay, so one, one... I mean, I would do school food and try to get Congress to back off of trying to undermine the school food rules. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a really good thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'd like a better farm bill that promoted public health instead of agribusiness. Ag right. You know, I mean, it's hard to know where to start because there's so much to do. Uh, do you, when you say you're a glass, glass half full kind of person, do you see enough going on to sustain your optimism about the glass being half full, given the forces that are oh, sort of yeah. on the other side? Yeah, I get asked that question all the time by students who, are, who just feel like they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so I try to tell them what the food environment was like 20 years ago, because the improvements have been breathtaking. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea that you can get food in supermarkets that's fresh and local and seasonal, you couldn't do that 20 years ago. The fact that we have organics, the fact that you know, people are able to um, buy these kinds of foods. I mean, that on that side, the differences have been enormous. The school food has improved enormously, even mm -hmm. though it still has a long way to go. Um, and, you know, from my own personal sort of quantitative way, when we started our food studies program at, was, at, at 1996, that was really a long time ago. We were the only food studies program in the country. There was a gastronomy program at Boston University, and everybody said, you're crazy. You can't bring food studies into a university. <laughs> I haven't been to a university in the last five years that didn't have a food studies program or some kind of functional 
equivalent. I mean, look what's happening at Berkeley. No, there's a lot happening. You know, there. 15 years ago, none of this was happening at Berkeley. And what was the impetus? How did that come about, starting the food studies program? Well, I had um, been hanging around with a group called Old Ways Preservation and Exchange Trust, a public relations firm in Boston that brought academics, chefs, and food writers together in fabulous places. Mm -hmm. It was just an amazing place. And I was talking to all these people who said, I'm really interested in food. I want to write about food. I don't know anything about food. How do I find out more about food? So when in our department, one of our most lucrative programs was taken away, mm -hmm. Everybody felt sorry for us, and they said, how would you feel if we took your hotel program and put it somewhere else at NYU? And I said, it depends on what I get. <laughs> and they said, what do you want? And I said, I want food studies. And there it was. And there it was. And did it take a while for it to become popular, or was it something that immediately attracted people? Well, it, was, it went from concept to state approval in nine months, which even at New York University is record-breaking. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, somebody who was working with me on it was a friend of a food writer at the New York Times and gave her an exclusive. And so in the New York Times, one week later, was this article about our food studies program. And we had people in our office that afternoon holding the clipping and saying, I've waited all my life for this program. <laughs> and I, I want to say something about that clipping because it was, the writer was Marion Burroughs and she called Alice Waters and asked Alice what she thought of this. And Alice made a really snippy comment, which was that how can they have a food studies program without doing anything about agriculture? Hmm. And at the time, I said, agriculture, what are we supposed to do, plant a garden in Washington Square Park? Well, you know what? She was right. And we have a garden on the campus now. So how long did it take you to get from the point where you were to deciding that she was right? Oh, it didn't take very long. I mean, I knew she was right. I just didn't know what to do about it. And when we, when we started working on the garden, um, it took seven years to get approval from NYU to plant it on the campus. <laughs> seven years. But there it is. Um, what do you think, um, uh, in terms of the sort of healthcare reform that we've had in the last couple of years, do you see, have you seen that interact with sort of the food movement in some way or other benefits from, <coughs> that you see from what's been going on with healthcare? Well, Kaiser is probably the best example of that. And mm -hmm. with its, you know, Kaiser figured out a long time ago that if the 10%, I mean, I, you'll have to correct me if I don't have this right, um, but if the 10% of Kaiser patients who are really, really sick and use all of the Kaiser money for health care um, could be reduced by a percentage or two. Mm -hmm. They would have lots of money to do lots of other things. So they figured out a long time ago that prevention pays. Mm -hmm. The government hasn't quite figured out that yet, but once the Affordable Care Act kicks in, it's going to be clear that having a healthier population is better for everybody. Uh, do you think that message will really get across? I mean, do you think people... Do I don't know how long it'll take, but it will come. And do you think Americans are actually capable of getting that message, that prevention is a something that's worth investing in? Well, I think lots of Americans do. Well, I'm not sure about... The, in, the investment thing is complicated because the economists say that the cost of prevention is so great mm -hmm. if you spread it across the entire population <laughs> that um, it'll be really expensive to do prevention. But people can do prevention on their own. And what you really want is people taking responsibility for their own health, going to doctors when they need it, um, and getting things taken care of before they get worse. Uh, you know, one minor fix that I find is effective for me is the listing of calorie counts on, you go into mm -hmm. a, the chain, or Starbucks, and the bagel is 500 calories or something, oh, yeah. it really makes you think twice, or it makes me think twice. Only if you look at them. If you look at them. <laughs> Only yeah, if you well, look at them. Well, a lot of I've noticed they make them very tiny, the calorie counts. Oh, very right. Tiny. Well, when the national law kicks in, um, the font size will be specified. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, and, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the typeface as well, or just the oh, font size? Oh, yeah. And, I mean, it's, well, I don't know if about, it has to be the same size as the price. Mm. Um, I think in the law. You know, that law was very, very long in coming. We've had calorie labeling since 2008 in New York City, 
And there have been lots and lots and lots of evaluations, and the evaluations show that it doesn't make much difference overall oh, in, in consumption patterns. But when they split out the people who actually look at the calorie labels from those who don't look at it, then it makes a difference. It certainly affects me. Uh, you know, I, I and you just said it affected it. you. We're not the core time. target audience for oh. calorie labeling, unfortunately. Um, maybe not. <laughs> so one of the things you wrote recently about on your blog was um, about the issue of uh, can sustainability questions be incorporated mm -hmm. into uh, nutritional guidelines, or should they mm -hmm. be? Is that something that, that is mm -hmm. appropriate in that? What, I mean, what's the issue there? Well, the issue there is that the dietary, the dietary guidelines under federal law, Congress in its infinite wisdom, decided that nutrition research is so changeable that we need to have new dietary guidelines every five years, even though if you boil them down, they all say the same thing, eat less, eat better, move more. Um, I mean, they really can be summarized very easily. Uh, but the current Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee decided that uh, we need to take account of the sustainability of agricultural production in the guidelines, particularly with respect to meat, because so much mm -hmm. of uh, climate change is of livestock climate production. change due to agriculture is due to livestock production, and so they started talking about these things. Um, but Congress, again, in its infinite wisdom, has ordered the Secretary of Agriculture not to allow that to happen. So, so I don't... It's purely on a nutritional basis without looking at the... Yeah, just look, and preferably just look at nutrients. Don't talk about foods. Just talk about nutrients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you see any... I mean, I think that does seem to be one of the uh, big things is everybody in the world wants to start eating more meat. We're going to be having a situation where everybody's going to be eating more meat. There's going to be even more land devoted mm -hmm. to livestock production. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems sort of like a insurmountable potentially problem. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's an enormous problem, and I guess the place that sort of shocks me the most is not so much about meat as it is about milk, and that is I've been to New Zealand a few times, and it's, you know, it used to be this just pristine green place covered with sheep, just millions of sheep everywhere, and they've gotten rid of their sheep and, their, uh, and have dairy farms growing milk for China. Um, and it's just completely changed the New Zealand landscape. Um, and, but it's making, that's what China wants and what India wants. I don't know if they want milk. I'm, I don't really understand the whole milk in China thing, and I wish somebody would explain it to me. <laughs> but um, I thought they were lactose intolerant generally, but um, there it is. What about, I mean, the, 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 I guess the dietary guidelines are also looking at cholesterol differently now. They're, they're oh, that's what the Washington that. Post says. I, I don't know. Saw that today. I don't know how the Washington Post knows that. The committee hasn't come out with its report yet. You want to just explain what, they, what the Washington Post Yeah, said? the Washington Post uh, got sent to me by re several reporters today who want comments on it. But apparently, the dietary guidelines committee is going to delete. Um, a recommendation that's been in the dietary guidelines since 1980, which is reduce cholesterol intake to 300 milligrams a day or less. An egg is about 300 milligrams. So, and eggs are the biggest source of cholesterol. So what that means is this is giving a free ride to eggs and taking cholesterol off. And the only thing that I could think of is that the new data that are coming out on eating eggs and, um, and cardiovascular disease are showing that people with uh, heart disease can eat as many eggs as they want. Uh, but the studies don't, and it doesn't affect their heart disease, but all of those people are taking statins. Um, so maybe the statins make up for it, and if you know, if we put statins in the water supply, we won't have to worry about any of that. Yeah, they, they, they <laughs> and that's been it. suggested, by the way. Right, and they don't think about the long-term consequences of everybody taking statins. So, um, what what uh, um, uh, do you? Um, what was I going to ask you? I forgot what I was going to ask you here. They could ask. Questions. Yeah, I think maybe it's time <laughs> to open it up for. Oh, I know. I, I did have one last question I wanted to ask you about. Uh, so I grew up with Wonder Bread. Everybody I knew who grew up with Wonder Bread preferred to eat it, you know, clumping it in as, as, as tightly as possible into a tiny ball. And well, that too. But then it just it just tasted much better. And I, I was wondering what it is about Wonder Bread that made everybody 
want to fold it up into, and, and you know, I mean, my friends, we all did it. We like, folded it up <laughs> about 50 times. This, is an, this is an arts and crafts project. I just, it, and I, and I've, I've, I've talked to other people, like, oh, how did you do bread? Yeah, that's what they did, too. I don't know if it was that it was just air, so you had to make it have substance. I don't know well, what it was. it just has this wonderful sticky quality. And it tasted good that way, to me. <laughs> as a 10-year-old, as a 10-year-old, I haven't had Wonder Bread in about 30 years, so. Yeah, I mean, I th just think you look at the ingredient list yeah, and that, <laughs> it, it violates one of my principles of, of, of eating, which is never eat anything with more than five ingredients. Yeah. It's got more than five. Right, it's got a lot. Um, mm. I mean, it, I, I still remember it helps build bodies 12 ways, I think, <laughs> helps build strong bodies 12 ways, I forget how many. Um, so I think it's good to be open up for questions. Um, so have someone with a mic? Yes, uh, uh, three things. <coughs> One would be, uh, maybe you could say something about uh, GMOs, uh, Monsanto, and possibly ur urban farming. There was just a great film made about urban farming right here in Albany called Occupy the Farm. And if people haven't seen it, it's incredible. Oh, I haven't, I'd like to. Yeah, maybe you could say something about those things, urban farming and uh, mm -hmm. GMOs. Was there a question? Was, yeah, was, I was there a GMOs, question? maybe you could say something about GMOs problem. What about them? Well, how bad they are. <laughs> <laughs> and especially Monsanto. Oh, Monsanto is just an awful company. Um, I was once at a, um, I go to a meeting of food industry executives every year, and I was once at a meeting years ago in which the um, executives of DuPont and Pioneer and a whole bunch of other companies were just screaming at the CEO of Monsanto, saying, you've just ruined this for us. Just absolutely ruined it for us. Um, yeah, it's an interesting company. I don't know what to say about GMOs. I'm not aware of any convincing evidence that they affect human health in any way other than they promote monoculture, which is, I think, a huge agricultural problem. Um, the, I don't like the patent business um, because they own the seeds and that's not very good for farming generally. Um, and they just require everybody to kind of get in line so they control the food supply. I think that's the biggest problem with them. I've never totally understood what the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, And Monsanto's the just an awful company. The mechanism for the biological harm that people think would be coming from it, it's never really been very clear to me what that, well, what that, what in that would be. I understand the monoculture. Yeah, the in my so book, on. Safe Food, I go through that. Half of the book, Safe Food, The Politics of Food Safety, is about GMOs. And um, there are three major health issues. And you know, the people who are against GMOs argue that uh, there's just never been testing. You know, the, the question is whether you do the testing before you right. release them into the food supply or whether you, do, you wait until there's trouble and then deal with it. Um, and the FDA decided, I, I, I have to tell you, I was on the Food Advisory Committee for the FDA when they approved GMOs, and the only thing that I can say in my favor is that when we finished our term of office, and they debriefed us. We said, what was the point of this advisory committee? And they said it was to give us some idea about the trouble that would arise over decisions we'd already <laughs> made. Um, so those of us who were consumer advocates on the uh, food advisory committee, the, one of the others was Joan Gussow, uh, we just said, you have got to label this stuff so people have a choice. You've got to do that and you need to take into consideration some of the issues that everybody was worried about at the time, allergies was mm -hmm. one, and, um, and some other kinds of things, but you know, they've been in the food supply for 20 years now, and there's, you, know, you can argue, well, they haven't looked hard enough to find health problems, but I don't see them. Mm -hmm. I just don't see them, and you, know, you can never prove safety. You can only prove things that are unsafe, you can but you can never f prove that something is safe, which is not to say that I like GMOs very mm -hmm. much. So, and I think they should have been labeled right from the beginning. It would have solved so many problems. Uh, yeah. Uh, microphone. Uh, I 
I guess first I'll oh. say um, we're Over both molecular. Now. Oh, we're both molecular biologists, and we really like how nuanced your response <laughs> to the GMO thing was. Um, and I guess now I'll I'll start with I hope not another hard question. <laughs> Um, so I, I know you said in your talk that you're a, a glass half full kind of person, but I was wondering if um, you could talk about how, um, I, I hope I don't offend anyone by saying, but it seems like the food movement is quite a, a white middle class <laughs> mm. movement, um, when the obesity problem seems to be more of um, a poverty problem. And so it's kind of like we're not really directing the, um, the the solutions where they need to be. Um, so I was wondering if, if you could, with that in mind, if um, you could think of like a single policy that would um, most reduce obesity. Community organizing. The um, I, I mean I heard Eric Schlosser speak last night, and if it was videotaped, which I hope it was, everybody should watch it. It was really ex an extraordinary speech, and and I've also heard him. I was once at Dartmouth. Uh, where he was being attacked by, um, he, it was at the Dartmouth Business School and he was giving a speech there and I was on a panel um, and everybody was attacking him for exactly that. This is an elitist movement, it's white, it's upper middle class. And he said something then and he said again in his speech last night, something that I've listened to very carefully and paid attention to, which was that food movements have to start someplace. And if you look at the civil rights movement, if you look at the women's movement, if you look at the environmental movement, they started with people who were in upper classes or were educated and had some money um, and then trickled down. I don't know anybody involved in the food movement who doesn't care about everybody else. And the question is, if you're white and working in one of these areas, what can you do in lower income communities? Well, I think you organize in the same way that you have to do community organizing for anything. Um, you try to identify leaders within the communities, um, you get them involved in the issues, and you support them in every way that you can. Um, and most of the people that I know who are working in the food movement are doing exactly that. And that's what they care about most. Wow, I have so many questions, but I'll limit it to one, which is um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people think that the USDA has a conflict of interest mm -hmm. because its job, its main job is promoting agricultural products, mm -hmm. and then it's also issuing dietary guidelines, mm -hmm. and that's why for many years we were all told to eat meat and, mm -hmm. and drink milk. Um, so I'm wondering if you think that's a problem, and if so, what you think, how, how things should be done differently? Well, we don't have independent food agencies in the government. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is very big, and most of its resources are involved in inspecting meat and dairy, and does meat and dairy. Um, and it has a small office, the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, that does dietary guidelines jointly with Health and Human Services. I mean, there's occasionally a push to put the dietary guidelines in Health and Human Services. I'm not sure that would do any good. The same lobbying is going to go at it there. But there are some structural issues that to me are fascinating in this. And, and these, I think, are kind of at the root of it. For one thing, the FDA gets its funding from congressional agriculture committees. What? The FDA, which is a public health agency and responsible for a great deal of regulation of the food supply, uh, gets its funding from congressional agriculture committees as a basis of its historical uh, being part of the Department of Agriculture a century ago. Um, so that's kind of weird. And then the other is that the Department of Agriculture and the FDA, because the FDA is, the commissioner of the FDA is level four down from the secretary and the equivalent food people in USDA are much higher, they can't talk <coughs> to each other, um, they can't even sit at the same tables. So there, there are structural problems for trying to coordinate 
what goes on in Washington between these agencies that are very fundamental and very difficult to change. Um, Congress is not interested in dietary guidelines. They cause so much trouble. Look at the trouble that they're causing, and they haven't even come out yet. The advisory committee has not even issued its research report, and already they're causing. They have caused Congress to do an intervention. Um, they've caused the press to write these amazing stories. I mean, maybe they're right. I don't know. Um, and they just cause endless, endless woe. Nobody wants to deal with this. Where would you put it? I don't know where it should go. I don't think we should be doing dietary guidelines every five years. I think it's silly. I mean, they say the same things. Um, and I can't wait to see what happens this time. It's going to be fascinating. And I hope that it comes out, uh, the new guidelines come out in the fall when I'm teaching food policy and politics. So we can talk about it in class. What well, basically relates to that? There's been obviously an explosion of food-related journalism <coughs> in the last 10, 20 years. And food-related journalism. So I'm just mm -hmm. wondering what your sense is of coverage of the issues that we've been talking about, um, how that's evolved and what your kind of assessment is in terms of, uh, you know, the coverage of the food industry and the food movement. Well, there are fabulous journalists and less fabulous journalists. And you know who the fabulous ones here, because they're all here this semester. Um, <coughs> excuse me, or most of them are here this semester. Um, some of it's good, some of it's not. I'm going to choke for a little while. Please if you'll, go ahead. Why don't you talk? <laughs> <coughs> well, while you're choking, maybe we can have somebody ask another question. Hi, um, my name's Kara, and I'm a public health student here at Berkeley. <coughs> I can listen while I'm choking. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, you touched a little bit on um, income disparities in your talk, but I was hoping you could expand a little bit on that, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how access to different kinds of foods may impact the growing disparity we have in terms of socioeconomic status in our country. Well, we have policies in this country that make fruits and vegetables more expensive, or apparently more expensive, excuse me, um, than junk foods. We could change that. These aren't immutable policies. Um, we could have an agricultural policy. We could change the Farm Bill so that the, I mean, I'm, the, I'm fond of saying that the, um, I taught a class on the Farm Bill a few years ago. I can't imagine what I was thinking. But I thought it would teach me about the Farm Bill. And I asked my class on the first day, what do you think the Farm Bill should do? And they came up with everything that a Farm Bill should do. It should promote public health. It should pay workers. It should, you know, prevent climate change. It should do all those, you know, good things. And that's not what our farm bill does. Our farm bill promotes industrial <coughs> agriculture. We could change that. Now, how do we change that? That requires changing election campaign laws, which requires overturning Citizens United. And there's a movement to do that, well worth joining. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we have a political situation now where we have a divided <coughs> Congress and nothing much is happening there. I say do it at the local level. You know, you want to do politics, do politics at the local level. There's a real chance at the local level for making real change. Berkeley just passed a soda tax. I, I mean, I think this is monumental. Uh, you take it for granted. You live here. Do you think it's monumental because you think other jurisdictions will follow? Absolutely. Berkeley did everything right. Berkeley did advocacy by the book in this soda tax, and no other community has done it by the book yet. And partly because Berkeley was doing it by the book, Bloomberg Philanthropies dropped some money in it, and that was quite helpful. Um, but the doing it by the book really helps, and everybody watching what, how, how it happened here and how it didn't happen in San Francisco knows what the differences are. Every single community in Berkeley got canvassed, no matter whether they were up the hill or down the hill. Every single community, that's part of where the Bloomberg money went, 
was to send canvassers into every single community. That's what you have to do. And so this became an issue that galvanized the voting public. People came out and voted. You know, 30% of Americans vote in elections, if that much. So this is where, if you want to change the food system, you got to change the political system, start local. It's really, I think it's too hard nationally right now. Um, but there's plenty that could be done on the local level. And, and there are lots of success stories all over the place of things that have happened. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm so in favor of doing something about school food. School food, no matter what the policy is, is completely person dependent. You can have all the policies you want, and if you don't have people on the ground in the school who really want to make the food healthy, you're fighting an uphill battle. But if you do have those people in the school, and there are lots and lots of them, you get miracles. And I've been to some of the poorest schools in New York City, in the poorest areas, and seen, walked into the cafeteria, and it smelled good. <laughs> Yum, what's for lunch? I want it. Um, and ask the school food service director, how'd you do this? She said, wait until you meet the principal. You know, it's that kind of thing. So you can make school by school changes, um, and what's going on with school food politics now is so bizarre. I mean, so absolutely unreal that the School Nutrition Association is arguing not to enforce the fruit and vegetable requirement. Those are the workers. What? Those are the, the these the are the. Workers. This is the. This is the political organization that, heavily funded by the food industry, that ostensibly represents school food service workers. So the school food service workers are the leading opposers of changing the school lunch to make it healthier? What? You know, I mean, that's just incredible. Um, but that's the political situation we live in, and that's one of the reasons why I think school food is so important. You gotta fight that. You know, and keep the, you know, I thought when the Department of Agriculture came out with the school food rules, that they were so weak and so generous to salt, sugar, and fat, I couldn't believe. You know, could we just have food and not talk about nutrients? I mean, that would be my view. Um, but in fact, the people who sell products to schools didn't see it that way. So, so these are, you know, these are important political battles on a school by school basis. A, a small, qu a small question. In the recent New York Times, I read that. Uh, Rats who were restricted to eating eight to 12 hours a day lost weight. Does that make any sense at all? Rats who were restricted. This is reported in the New York Times Science If you section. don't eat all day long, you're not gonna take in as many calories. It makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, food has calories. The more you eat, the more calories you're taking in. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're not eating half the day and you don't make up for it in the other half, that should work. Well, in theory, if it, if it had no effect at all, you could eat all those calories in, in an hour. You could. Oh, yeah, you could. Yeah. But I just it wondered if that, I mean, if that really makes any sense in terms <coughs> of helping with the obesity epidemic. Well, I think people have to find their own way mm -hmm. if they're having trouble with overweight and what, what way they can best keep calories managed. Um, I mean, I think I that's, it's kind of what I do. I, I keep them out of the house. Calorie, you don't, you don't I have, have calories have in the few, house? I have a few calories <laughs> in my house, right? I have very few calories in my house. <coughs> yeah, you know, if, if you have a problem with chocolate, don't have it in the house. What do you have to say about the racialization of food marketing, uh, like food companies donating to groups like um, NAACP, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, my next book is uh, Soda Politics, which is a book about the soda industry, which is part of the reason why I was so interested in the Berkeley soda tax. Um, and a lot of the book is about race and class. A lot of it is. And there's a chapter on marketing to minorities in which I review the history of soda company marketing to minorities, which is a not an uncomplicated history. And it's complicated because in the 1950s, 
the Hispanic and African American communities demanded that soda companies market to them, that they advertise in African American and Hispanic publications, that they hire African Americans and Hispanics as salespersons, and so forth. And in fact, there were Martin Luther King on the night before he died, uh, the night before he was assassinated, gave a speech in which he urged his followers to boycott Coca-Cola because they weren't hiring African Americans. So if this is not an uncomplicated story. Um, so then obesity changes, obesity changes things. And um, the, the higher levels of obesity and overweight and type 2 diabetes in low income African American and Hispanic communities kinds of changes the way that you look at this. Um, the soda companies asked, you know, they, they were asked to support community organizations and they did support community organizations. And in my book I have a table that lists um, a very large number of African American and Hispanic organizations that are sponsored by soda companies. Um, and it's really only recently that the communities have started taking a good hard look on at what this means and comparing the soda sponsorship to cigarette sponsorship, mm -hmm. uh, which parallel it in, in really the same way. Um, so it didn't surprise me that the NAACP opposed Mayor Bloomberg's soda cap. That was not, and, or the Hispanic Federation. That, that, those were not surprises. Uh, what did surprise me was that the city had not gone to those groups in advance to try to bring them on board and explain what they were doing and ask them for their support. That hadn't happened. And the head of the New York City NAACP, I quote in the book, said, you didn't come to us. If you'd come to us, we would have listened. So it comes down to community organizing. I really think it does. And if you want to reach people who need this message, or you, you, know, you want to help people be healthier, you have to do community organizing around it and listen to what they have to say and how they think it should be done. This is standard public health. I, I talked to a public health class yesterday. This is public, this is public health planning and evaluation. This is straight out of planning, public health planning. You go into a community, you find out what the needs are, you work with the community to identify the needs, to identify goals and objectives for meeting those needs. You implement it with the community, you evaluate, you go back and do it again. Um, that's community organizing. Public health, it's a good thing. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. And it works. Um, related to that question, also um, in your new book, Research, did you look at the um, extension of the racialization, you might call it, of and, and the whole issue of soda sales, the increase in sales in Mexico and other developing countries, uh, throughout Latin America, actually, yeah. and Africa? And related to that, I'm wondering if you saw any evidence of organizing efforts whereby people in the North were collaborating with people in the South to raise consciousness and raise... Um, opposition to that kind of marketing. Yeah, the best, I mean, soda companies can't sell sodas in the United States, so they've moved them overseas. And the only country in which Coca-Cola is not present is Cuba, and it's not going to be much longer. You know, they just went into Myanmar, and the, um, you know, th th this is a country that, in which people had to be taught to drink cold drinks, because they never had them before. So part of the education was how you chill the drink, and what else you do. Um, and the soda companies have announced that they are putting between five and ten billion dollars into Africa, India, and China each. You know, five to ten billion dollars in each of those places in marketing over the next five to ten years. Mm -hmm. um, and there's already a lot of money in Latin America, but the best place for the collaboration that you're talking about is in Mexico around the Mexico soda tax. Uh, that Mexico passed a soda tax and did that with a, advocacy, with a group of advocacy groups 
in Mexico, very well organized and very talented, who were funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies and were very successful, and now it's being evaluated to see whether it did any good. The first thing the soda companies did was to reduce the price of sodas in rural areas. So they're not, I mean, Coca-Cola and PepsiCo are very deeply embedded in, a, in Mexican rural culture um, as a result of enormous efforts that took place 10 or 20 years ago. Okay. So it's been difficult. One more? Yeah. Well, Last but not least. Okay. Yes. What would be your best argument against um, uh, the campaign to that um, that says that, um, like the 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 campaign that any kind of public health intervention is paternalistic? What oh would be yeah. your best counter argument? Yeah, I hear that all the time, um, and that that's um, an argument that resonates with Americans very very well. Um, the, the nanny state. I mean, one of the famous things that the soda industry did in New York City was to uh, put a full page ad in the New York Times of Mayor Bloomberg in a dress. Of, you know, don't let a nanny tell you what to eat. Um, and when Bloomberg was asked about it, he said, oh, no, I would never wear a dress like that. It's so unflattering. <laughs> and a sense of humor. Um, the government is already involved in food choice. That's usually my starting place. And uh, it's already deeply involved in the kind of food choices that we have now. So it's not as if our food choices are independent of government interaction now. The government labels, the government taxes, the government um, promotes the production of some foods at the expense of other foods. It makes some foods cheaper than other foods. This is a system that was set up by humans and it can be changed. And all that's happening is that people are trying to tweak the system to make the healthy choice the easy choice. That's all. Um, you can still buy as many sodas as you want, but let's make the healthier choice easier for people. Um, and I'm, the people buy it, I don't know. I don't know what else to say, but you know, if you're talking to somebody who's really dug in on this, it's hard to convince them. But if you're talking to people who are really concerned about health and want people to be healthier and think it would be great if people were, were healthier, you just show them what the environment looks like now and say, what would happen if that changed and it looked different? You know, that's one of the reasons why people are pushing so hard on Happy Meals because the, it's, people always do the default. Um, it's easier to do. I mean, that was why Bloomberg's soda cap was such a good idea, because it would make the default smaller. People could buy as many 16-ounce sodas as they wanted. Nobody was going to stop them from that. But everybody knows that human nature is you just eat one. So the default would be smaller, and that would help people um, control calories better. I thought it was a really good idea. What we do have this fetish as Americans, though, that we can't have anybody tell us what to do. We're all, all completely independent, and right. we all make our own decisions. Oh, that, that it were true. Sort of <laughs> oh, so. that it were true. Um, yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think thank you. Thank you. Sorry about the choking. Happens. Hey, we don't need to choke sometimes. <laughs>